Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for California Paid Family Leave 101, um, April 17, 2020. Um, this uh, webinar is being recorded. Thank you so much for joining us today. This uh, webinar series is brought to you um, in partnership with the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence. I am, uh, I lead the statewide prevention program at the partnership. We, we call ourselves uh, the partnership for, for short um, and also to represent the way in which we work. Um, the partnership is California's recognized domestic violence coalition. We represent over a thousand advocates, organizations, preventionists, um, allied groups, all of us sharing the vision of a California free from domestic violence. Um, I am a child of domestic violence. I am a survivor of domestic violence. Um, as a child, hearing my, my mother um, talk about the number one reason why she did not leave was um, finances. Um, economic insecurity holds a lot, of, a lot of survivors, a lot of victims um, in an unhealthy relationship. Um, so we will be talking more about that. We have a lot of DV uh, organization representatives here with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I see a lot of our, our colleagues are, are here. Thank you for joining us. I'm so excited to have you here. Um, funding for this webinar is made possible in part by um, the CDC. Thank you so much for your support. Um, and we also have uh, support from the Blue Shield of California Foundation. Um, always very much committed to the prevention of violence um, and the support of healthier families, um, healthier individuals, healthier children overall. Thank you so much, Blue Shield, um, for your support. All of our contributors, our collaborators, we've got an amazing team of experts, trainers, advocates, and community organizers coming together. Um, ACLU Southern California, Senator Maria Elena Durazo, um, the California Breastfeeding Coalition, um, the Partnership, uh, Breastfeed LA, Rock of LA, uh, Mi Familia Vota, Work Life Law, Legal Aid at Work, and Equal Rights Advocates. You are going to hear from a lot of these folks um, today. Um, if you have specific questions, again, please make use of your chat. Um, we will be able to answer your questions today. Who am I? Who is this weirdo that is at the front answering um, your questions and welcoming you today? Um, as I mentioned, uh, I am Alejandra Aguilar, uh, gender pronoun she, her, hers. Um, I lead the statewide prevention program at the partnership, um, working to strengthen prevention efforts across our state um, because we do believe that, that violence can be prevented. Um, most of us did not grow up learning how to have healthy relationships. Um, so the more we're able to learn uh, about healthy relationship behaviors, conflict resolution, um, stress management, especially in these times, um, the more we will be able to have healthier um, relationships overall. I am your facilitator for today. Um, if you have any questions, you can send them directly to me. Um, I will be moderating throughout um, this morning. Um, so if you have any, again, any questions or any specific comments, um, you can direct them to me. So great to have you all here today. Um, I know I mentioned this already, but everyone is muted. Um, if you have questions, you can add them in the chat. Also, when we open up Q&A later, you can unmute yourself. Um, some buttons, just wanted to make sure I go over all of those buttons before we, we move forward. You have um, some buttons that show up in your uh, Zoom uh, platform. Um, if you do not want your face to show up, you can just put stop video um, and your face will disappear or you can start your video back up and see your face um, on when you speak or when you say something. So I know we have a lot going on in our lives right now. You can turn your video off um, and simply type into the chat if you have that. We're gonna have some polls that are gonna be jumping up um, in just a bit. Um, so those will pop up on your screen. You can answer those. Again, those are confidential um, and anonymous. Um, I will be sharing the screen today. Um, just want to make sure that you are aware of where everything is at. Our presenters for today, 
We have amazing presenters, um, fabulous friends, colleagues of all of ours. Um, if there's one thing I can say about everyone, if everyone is approachable, reach out to folks. Um, we are here to answer your questions and to support you all. Um, Aditi Fruwala, attorney and advocate at ACLU Southern California, pronouns she, her, hers. Um, Aditi is a staff attorney at ACLU of Southern California in the LGBTQ Gender and Reproductive Justice Project. Um, amazing um, attorney, friend, colleague, um, you will be able to connect with Aditi. Aditi, if you wouldn't mind typing your contact information into the chat so that folks are able to contact you directly if they have any questions afterwards. Jenya Cassidy is director of the California Work and Family Coalition, gender pronouns she, her, hers. Um, amazing organizer, uh, labor and community organizer, very much committed to the work of ensuring that we all have access to paid family leave, very much committed to paid family leave since um, it was started in California. Way to go, Jenya. Thank you for bringing all of us together. I'm so excited to be here. Jenya will be speaking with all of us in just a bit. You're getting some claps. Woohoo! People are excited to see you, Jenya. Thank you so much. Julia Parrish, a senior staff attorney at Legal Aid at Work, gender pronouns she, her, hers. Um, as a member for our work and family and survive programs, Julia assists with the project helplines and provides legal advice, know your rights workshops, and direct legal services for workers struggling with family and medical crises. Thank you so much, um, Julia. Uh, very knowledgeable um, English, Spanish, um, very connected to the work. Um, thank you so much. Is, is also on um, violence prevention uh, leadership for California. Our mission, look at all those beautiful faces. Um, some of you are, are in our picture today. Um, the mission of the California Working Family Coalition is to organize communities to realize equitable family-friendly workplaces and to expand the social safety, safety net in California through policy, advocacy, and education. Yes, stellar panel, um, amazing advocates. Uh, again, if there's one thing I can say about all of us is that we care. Um, we are here for you. Uh, this is a, a webinar, um, but it's also a discussion. It's a conversation with all of us, so um, please make it yours. Um, feel free to add questions in the conversation because we want to make sure that you get out of this what you came here for. Um, our, learning, our learning and training goals for today are we hope that you are able to walk away knowing how to navigate the California Paid Families Leave um, and adjacent laws through information tools and resources. Again, today is webinar one of the three. Um, this is a series where you will be able to get access to tools, resources, and information. Um, we would like to introduce you to the new Paid Family Leave Training Toolkit. I am so excited about this. Um, it is going to be available to everyone in English and Spanish with exercises that help you build skills in individual and group education. So if you are someone who works out in the community um, and would like to have a, a checklist or quick and easy guide on how paid family leave works, this training toolkit is for you um, and you're going to get access to it. So um, you will hear about this throughout our three trainings. Um, we're also going to learn about changes to the laws related to COVID-19 crisis, including applying for unemployment insur insurance and other support. Um, because this webinar series is ongoing, again, the next one is April 22nd, third one is May 5th. Um, if there is information that we do not get to or um, that you are not seeing, please make sure and let us know so that we can um, adjust in the next couple of trainings. Um, we are also responding to timely updates and we'll be able to keep you posted on items as they are coming up. A um, little more on what you are going to learn about today, which I, I just kind of mentioned a little bit just making sure that you all have facts about paid family leave, um, the difference between job protection and uh, wage replacement, new laws related to COVID-19 um, and where to go for more information. 
Um, but before I continue, I would like to um, hand it over to Jenya so that you can, she can talk to us more about um, why we are here and why this matters um, today. Jenya. Oh, there we go. I didn't know I could unmute. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, just wanted to welcome everybody. This is a collaboration between all of the different organizations that you saw and the great trainers we have. And um, I mostly just wanted to say that it seems like a lot of you on this today are here because you are getting questions in your life. You really want to share this with your community, with other people um, that you're working with. And that's exactly what this training is partly for, that we have these incredible experts and people who are coming together to share not only what they've known about how the laws have been working, but a lot of new knowledge, um, just new things that are happening because of COVID-19. So um, we really wanna be able to share this with you and work with all of you, whoever wants to stay connected and work with um, all of our big community to just keep getting support from each other so that we can be sure people know their rights when they need to take time off, whether it's to care for themselves, their family, um, be home with kids that, whose schools are canceled right now, all of the ways that we need to be home and be able to have economic security. So welcome, and um, as Alejandra mentioned before, the coalition's a big statewide alliance of people and organizations that are really fighting to make sure that we all have the right to care for ourselves and each other. So welcome. Thanks so much, Jenya. So um, to get us going, first uh, question of the, well, actually second question of the day, because I already asked you, um, where are you from? What brings you here? Second question of today is, what does having the time to care, bond, or heal mean to you? Um, as we are thinking about paid family leave, um, its benefits, um, the, the reasons why we use it, why does it matter? What does having the time to care, bond, or heal mean to you? If you wouldn't mind typing that into the chat so that we can hear your thoughts. Um, why does it matter? Why does paid family leave matter? I'll give you a couple of moments to type that in. I'm also going to type my answer in. Thank you so much for your responses. We're seeing, enjoying the time with family. Um, if you don't take time to care for yourself, you can't continue to take care of others. Um, pain family leave matters to gain peace and heal. Physical health and mental health for moms and babies. It's a human right to be able to experience all of those things. The ability to see another day to its fullest. Means that I get to get better and with whatever I'm dealing with to be able to care for others. Yes. It means being able to recharge for me. A care needs fuel, so does the mind and body. Time to care, bond, heal gives us the stability that we need to function in our lives. Thank you so much. We are definitely navigating um, the stress, uh, the increased stress level right now. Um, more than ever, this is this is so pertinent to all of us right now. Gives time for all of us to spend with children and don't worry about their income, ability to secure financial, their finances and secure their job. Thank you. Mind, body, soul, and spirit. Absolutely. Um, it means families. It means families are valued and work balance is important. Yes. 
not having to worry about not having coverage at my job or losing my job. Yes. So true. It means a lot to me. It reduces stress and enables me to be present for important moments in my life without having to worry about my finances. We are seeing that a lot, being able to be present and reduces the, the worry in finances. Thank you. To get well, absolutely. Being able to um, be well for you and for your family. Creating a world of change for someone, absolutely. If you are a caregiver, um, being able to be present for your loved ones um, while reducing uh, financial stress. Having time of adjustment, whether it be after a childbirth, illness, or transition in life. Connections with children, yes, we're going to, to be chatting about a lot of, a lot of these in, in just a bit. Just wanted to hear from you all. Um, why does paid family leave matter? Oh, yes. It means that my family can have me at my full capacity, staying present and completely tuned into their needs as they recover. It means that the emotional and tangible support provided by me is fully committed to their well-being. I love that. To bond and have job security. Yes. So the person can have time to get better, whether it's physically or emotionally. Thank you so much. Um, please continue chiming in. Why does paid family leave matter? Um, bonding being with family, caregiving. It's essential for our mental health, knowing you will not lose your job. Yes, it, it creates room for a family-centered society that isn't based on income level. I love this. Love, love, love. Thank you so much. Please continue um, chiming in. Um, we have a, a great um, advocate here with us today uh, that knows all about having time to care, bond, um, and heal, um, and the importance that it has for all of us. Um, hold on one second. I can't get the, this to go. We are going to move forward through these real quick because I want to get to um, our guests. Uh, Senator Maria Elena Durazo um, is their uh, champion in paid family leave. Um, she is a guest that will be speaking uh, with all of us today. I'm so excited to have uh, Senator Maria Elena Durazo here, um, very much always committed to the work. Um, Senator Durazo was elected to the California State Senate in 2018 to represent the 24th Senate District, which covers the communities of Boyle Heights, East LA, Pico Union, MacArthur Park, Eagle Rock, Silver Lake and East Hollywood. Um, she has been a champion for workers' rights, healthcare, and immigrants. Um, Senator Durazo fought for expanding Medi-Cal to cover all undocumented adults in California. Thank you so much. Um, in 2019, Senator Durazo championed SB 225, which would allow undocu undocumented immigrants to sit on boards and commissions. Senator Maria Elena Durazo graduated from St. Mary's College, where she became involved in the Chicano movement. She has a law degree from the People's College of Law. She currently serves as vice chair of the Democratic, Democratic National Committee. Um, a champion committed to all of us, to all of our work. Um, very much approachable. Um, if you see Senator Maria Elena Durazo, um, go up to her, say hello. She is um, available to, to talk to all of us. So uh, I am going to hand it over to um, Senator Durazo. You can unmute yourself um, so that we can see you and hear you. Let me see. Might be dealing with. Yes, um, 
Williams, uh, you will need to unmute yourself. Let me uh, let me add that over to you. Okay, I can. You granted me permission. Thank you. Would you be able to grant the senator permission? We're on two different computers. Oh, okay. Um, I don't see her. Is she on another one? She should be on. Come on. Um, oh. I'm on somewhere. Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Hello. We can hear you. I don't know. If, can we see you? Do you have a camera on? Uh, how do I know? I'm not sure how to. Same as this is like you can um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, you should have a start video, um, stop video icon. Yeah, um, you should be able to press that and start your video so that we can see you. It's not, uh, it's not showing up, uh, just the mute or unmute showing up. Um, select speaker, same. I don't know if you have a, a video capability. Well, I've, I, I'm not able to turn that on for you either. So you might not have it connected. Okay, well, let's see. But talk to us. I will turn your image back on so that we can see your face on the screen and we'll be able to hear your voice. Okay. All right. I'm so sorry. Hi, Alejandra. Good morning. Thank you. Um, Thank you for all of the work that you're doing. Uh, things are a little bit more complicated than showing up and, and being there in person with you, but I'm very proud to be with you in the best way that we can under these circumstances. Um, and thank you to all the organizations that are, that are sponsoring this training and this informational session. I think it's not only for the good of our, to get the information and pass it on to our communities, and our families, but it's also good for us to talk to each other um, in, the, in the best way that we can. So, you know, coming out of the labor movement, Alejandra, you know, fighting for, you know, not only workplace issues, but how, as, as you know, how does the workplace get connected to the family? How do we bring the sensitivity to the workplace? The fact that when I go to work, I don't just you know, close the door on all the needs of my family. I still have to watch out for my family. I still have to care for my family. And they might get sick one day, but I might, um, I might lose somebody, uh, you know, another day. There is a lot, a lot of connection between the two. And so I really, really, you know, my whole life was, my whole life was really about making the yeah. connection between our families as we fought for immigration rights. Yeah, part of it was about uh, the workplace, but a lot of it was, how about at home? How do you make your family feel secure and cared for um, in, in every way possible? So uh, we fought for paid time off. It's for vacation, it's for sick leave, it's for bereavement, it's to take care of a family member when they're ill, it's when you don't have a job, it's when you're yourself, you're ill, but our family and our health needs can't be separated from our jobs. Um, they're completely connected. And getting the white, right wage replacement is also important. And your right to ask for these things when they are your rights is also important to protect your rights uh, to be able to claim these benefits is also important. So I um, I'm, um, just want to say that today under this pandemic more than ever more than ever paid family leave and sick leave are so important we need to watch out for each other and our most vulnerable communities are the ones that need it the most so uh you're um, we're relying on you we're relying on you as community organizers and advocates to make sure the word gets out about these resources about their rights programs like paid family leave 
um, unemployment insurance, um, this, all these uh, disability insurance. Uh, if you have never applied to any of these programs, it can be challenging, uh, you know, the, especially online now. And sometimes online isn't as, um, as technologically as advanced as they say it is. Uh, at the state level of the government, we're working really hard to address the needs. Uh, Julie Sue, our Secretary of Labor, is doing a phenomenal job. Um, the EDD department is working seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. for questions. I know that's not enough, um, but it, hundreds of people have been added to the staff. So get those applications in and just keep at it, keep at it. Um, your connection to our communities is what's going to make our communities safer. Um, and we're trying to get our, our governments, different levels of government to uh, work hand in hand, um, uh, to be more coordinated uh, for all the things that you need, like housing, employment, and food assistance. So I know we're going to get through this because we care for each other. We're watching out for each other. We're watching each other's backs. But um, it is going to take person by person. You know, uh, in the farm worker movement, they used to say the most important slogan that came out of it was "Si se puede," and that's true. But mm -hmm. it was a more important slogan, which was "One by one by one." That's how we get to our community. Um, and then, lastly, I just want to you know reach out and say our office is also a resource. So please call us and get your phone number. Uh, my phone number is. 213-483-9300. Call our office and we'll jump in and help in any way we can. So that's it. Thanks for the time, Alejandra. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, let me put this number into the chat. 213-483-9300. 9300. We just got Senator Durazo's number. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Uh, gracias, thank you Alejandro. For showing up for, for un thank you for showing up for undocumented workers. Um, we appreciate you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Williams and my staff was also available, so keep his name in mind. Thank you, Alejandra. Thanks, Williams. Thank you for showing up. <laughs> You're welcome. Cuídese mucho. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. She is amazing. We love hearing from her all the time. She is amazing. Um, she is a champion. She shows up. Um, she's always present for paid family leave. Um, wonderful, wonderful person um, to be uh, championing paid family leave. Um, thank you so much, Senator Maria Elena Durazo, for, for showing up for, for paid family leave. Let me back up a little bit. Where were we? We were right here. Perfect timing. She spoke about so much of this. Um, so I will be uh, glancing through um, a little bit of this, but thank you so much um, to Senator Elena Durazo for, for mentioning so many of the, these. Um, we asked the question of, of what is the, the, the impact, right? Why, why does it matter? Um, and it has such an impact on all of our lives. Um, there is research that shows that it improves health outcomes for new parents and children, um, whether that be um, research that takes place, uh, place through university with, with long um, uh, data sheets, or we talk to families and friends, and we know that this has an impact um, for new parents and children to be able to spend time um, at home with their loved ones, uh, be able to focus on being parents, on that new transition in their lives. Um, reducing also that, that financial stress that we so much speak about. Um, and are definitely hearing and feeling right now. Um, for new parents, it lowers the risk for postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety. This is very real. Um, folks' bodies shift and transition um, after having a child or bringing a child into a home. Um, so that, that, that risk for depression and anxiety is decreased um, because your financial stress is decreased and your mental and physical health um, are, are cared for. So it reduces that, that um, risk for folks. Um, it helps families and individuals on the economic brink avoid bankruptcy when they have new children. You will hear us talk a lot about financial stress today because we know that this is a huge risk factor um, for abuse, 
uh, for anxiety, for depression, for stress. Um, so this is why so many of us are advocating for, for paid family leave. Um, for children, it allows for children to be able to bond. Um, it allows for, for us to focus on their health, um, including reducing infant mortality. Uh, it, includes, it increases the rate and duration of breastfeeding, which is associated with lower rates of infection and sudden infant death syndrome. Um, it's also very important for us to, to think about who gets access to information about breastfeeding. Um, as Senator Durazo mentioned, it's most often the marginalized that are forgotten. Um, and we hear from, from the Breastfeeding Coalition about who gets access to it, who is talked to about breastfeeding, and who is encouraged um, to do so. So through the California Work and Family Coalition in partnership with the member orgs, um, we speak a lot about um, why breastfeeding is so important, why it's so important for us to, to advocate for paid family leave to allow for, for room um, for breastfeeding. Caregivers. Um, we saw in the chat that we have a lot of family caregivers in the house. Um, I am one of them. Um, and I know that as a caregiver, uh, having access to paid family leave allows for us to remain in the workforce. Um, again, if we are uh, staying committed in our jobs, we're, we're feeling like we're contributing to the economy and we're actually contributing to the economy. So it, it improves our financial um, stability. It helps us feel more secure. Um, it also uh, secures our retirement and lifetime wage growth. Um, so the more stable we are in our finances, in our economy at home, um, the more stable we will be with our mental health and physical well-being. Relationships. Um, I mentioned I am from the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence. Um, and again, the number one reason why um, I am a huge supporter of paid family leave is that it helps um, reduce financial stress. Um, it also helps reduce poverty and gender inequality, which are um, huge risk factors for, for uh, relationship violence. Um, we know that if you are in a relationship where you are more financially dependent off of someone um, or there's that gender inequality, you are more at risk of, of remaining there. Um, it's also in terms of prevention, if we start our relationship with more gender equality, um, financial stability, and are more financially um, independent, um, then our relationships have a, a greater percentage of, of thriving, of being healthy and safe because they are based on equality and respect, um, which are the two main factors that help um, for successful relationships are equality and respect. Um, again, the economic hardship and the financial stress um, lead to conflict and potential uh, violence in the home. Um, if you think about the, the times that you've been in relationships and, and when arguments come up um, or working with clients, um, one of the top three reasons is finances. Um, we struggle, we, we disagree, we argue over money. Um, and especially in these times, we are hearing from so many community members about the challenges that they are facing. Um, we now have children at home, uh, family members in the home, this increases uh, economic hardship, which adds financial stress, which brings in that risk factor for relationship violence. So if we are able to um, advocate for paid family leave and get folks out to access to those economic supports that they need, we are able to contribute to healthier relationships. Um, also thinking of relationships, the relationships we have with children, the children in our home. Um, paid family leave also helps reduce um, child abuse because, again, if we are healthier, um, if our mental health is safer and healthier at home, um, the, the chances and the risk for, for abuse are also decreased. I spoke about this already, economic independence, um, very much uh, about also escaping uh, violence for, for survivors. The impact that it has on our health care costs. Um, workers with, with paid sick days are more likely to receive preventative care, um, thus reducing long-term health costs. If we have access to be able to take those days off to take care of ourselves, whether it be preventative or 
um, having access to, to health care in a timely manner without having to worry about losing our jobs um, or our wages. We, we live healthier. Um, so this is, this is a, another reason why so many of us are gathered here. We want to ensure that folks have access um, to health care um, and that they have access to, to health care in, in a way that doesn't um, put their jobs at risk. Um, this is also for, for parents to use. Um, when working with immigrants, um, especially undocumented workers, um, we hear that not everybody knows that they can use uh, paid sick days to care for their children, um, a loved one, take them to regular wellness or checkup. Um, this increases also vaccination rates and compliance for public school attendance. Again, we're more likely to show up um, to work be more productive at work and at school um, if we are healthier with our mental health um, and our um, bodies. So it, it has a huge impact on, on all of us. Um, I mentioned the gender pay gap. Um, it helps close the, the pay gap between all folks of all gender. Um, it helps women remain in the workforce and fulfill their lifelong earning potential. Um, the more we are able, all of us across all genders, to have access um, to health care, healthier relationships, um, equity and pay, the, the more uh, safer and healthier relationships that we live at home and at work. Businesses uh, thrive. Um, we improve employee productivity and retention in a workplace. This has been shown across so many spaces that the more folks are able um, to feel healthy and safe, um, at work and at home, the more likely they are to be productive and engaged at, at, at work. So we know that this helps. We know that this makes a, a huge impact on, on all of us. We already heard from Senator um, Durazo. So um, first poll question, let me pull this up. You are going to use your, your first one. I'm going to launch it now. Have you used paid family leave? If you wouldn't mind typing into your screen, yes or no. Look, we are seeing it live. I love this. People are answering. Let's give folks a, a couple of, of more seconds. 109 out of 233 today have voted. Please go ahead and vote. Um, add your um, comments in here. Have you used paid family leave? Yes or no? As of now, we have 70% no. If you are not able to see the poll because you are calling in, um, I know some folks are not connected, but they are on the computer. So yes, please also chat in. Um, we can't hear from the folks that are just on the phone. I apologize for that. So we have 68% no, 32% yes. Um, thank you so much for, for voting. Thank you so much for, for telling us about uh, who you are, um, because this helps us figure out, you know, how to talk about, about paid family leave. So thank you so much. Let's see. Do you have a next one? If you have taken paid family leave before, to what extent did it reduce your financial stress? So let me launch this second poll. If you did take paid family leave before, to what extent did it reduce your financial stress? It did not reduce your financial stress at all. It reduced your financial stress a little. It reduced your financial stress a lot. I hope that you are also able to see the live responses. Um, but we have, it goes back and forth between 40 and 50 in reduce my financial stress a little, reduce my financial stress a lot. Let's give folks an opportunity to vote. You can't see the answers, okay. I will share as soon as folks um, are finished. I know they're still going. Now you can see them, correct? So 51% said 
they reduced their financial stress a little. 36 said a lot. 13, it did not reduce their financial stress. Um, this is important for us to know uh, as well. We know that during um, this crisis that we're all in, um, that our financial stress is higher. So we're, we're wanting to advocate for as many um, economic supports as possible so that we can help reduce this financial stress, again, for, for all of our well-being. Okay. Go to the next one. I have the next question. Have any of you needed to take paid family leave but did not because you were unable to? Yes or no? Have any of you needed to take paid family leave but did not because you were unable to? We also have the question, if you answered yes to the previous question, why were you not able to take paid family leave? Your responses are coming in. Yeah, you need to answer um, the first one, yes or no. Um, have you needed to take paid family leave but did not because you were unable to? So if you mark yes, you were unable to, um, then you're able to answer the next question. If you answered yes, um, why were you not able to take paid family leave? Um, so I know, I think we're, I think everyone is done. Let me give it another five seconds. So we have that 57% um, said no, 43% um, said yes. If you answered yes, why were you not able to take paid family leave? Um, I did not know if I qualified, 28%. I could not afford to take time off work, 20%. Um, we're gonna be speaking about um, job replacement or, or wage replacement um, today. 14% were worried about losing their job, 10% we're afraid of being demoted, being given negative points or other negative consequences. If you have another reason for why you were not able to take paid family leave, if you wouldn't mind putting it into um, the chat so that we know what other reasons um, prevented you from taking access to paid family leave. Thank you so much. I already did this one. All right, we are going to um, move forward with Aditi Fruwala, um, attorney and advocate for ACLU. Um, Aditi, I am so excited to hear from you and have everyone um, hear from, from you. You are an amazing advocate, um, attorney, and a wonderful person to be able to get us going um, as we learn about the barriers to paid leave. So I'm gonna hand it over to you and turn off my video so that we can focus on, on you. Amazing, thank you so much, Alejandra. I am so delighted to be here and thanks for all that incredible background information. I've done paid family leave advocacy for a while and it still shocks me to think about all of the, the long list of benefits of paid family leave for parents and families and for relationships. Um, so it just feels like such an, an obviously necessary benefit that everyone should have access to, but there is a lot of people that don't. And so now we're going to talk about why not everyone um, is taking paid family leave. This list is not exhaustive. There are many barriers that people face, but here are some of the most common ones um, that people cite and many that we've seen actually in the chat today. 
So the first is lack of awareness. People don't know about the paid family leave program in California, or they don't know if they're eligible for paid family leave, or they don't know how to apply for paid family leave. Uh, these are a few of the things that we're hoping to address today and on the webinar series, and we won't be able to cover everything, but we're hoping to provide you with enough information to kind of arm you with the knowledge that you need to talk to your communities. And we are always here if you have more questions and specific questions about your particular situation. Um, the second reason is a low take up among new immigrants and monolingual Spanish speakers. There are a few reasons for this. Uh, the first and probably most common is that many undocumented people don't know that they qualify for paid family leave. So I wanna say this upfront and we're gonna repeat this many times because it's important. Undocumented people qualify for paid family leave. If they meet the other eligibility requirements, which we'll talk about later what those are, being undocumented alone does not prevent you from accessing paid family leave. And I think this is important, especially right now, there's so much discussion about not qualifying for other benefits like unemployment insurance um, and, you know, undocumented folks aren't receiving the stimulus check that the federal government is receiving. And so it's important to highlight the benefits that they do qualify for so you know what you can be applying for. Um, Another reason that there's a low take up among monolingual Spanish speakers is that the application is in English. Uh, this is plainly ridiculous. It's unacceptable in California. A bill was passed last year that requires um, the application to be in other languages by 2025, but you know, we're not there yet. And so that, that is one of the reasons. Um, another reason is that the application process is really difficult to navigate. It's long, it's complicated, you have to submit documents, and there's a lot of overlapping laws that we're going to talk about today. Um, we'll have a separate webinar about the ins and outs of actually doing the application, but it is a really complicated process. Um, the fourth reason is the wage replacement is not enough, and we saw several people already kind of cite that as a reason why they haven't applied. When you take paid family leave, you receive 60% or 70% of your wages. And for many people, 60% or 70% just isn't enough. We have seen data that one third of people who would otherwise qualify for paid family leave don't take it because they can't afford to just make 60% or 70%. There's a lot of people who can't afford to make anything less than 100% of their wages. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So the the next reason is a limited definition of paid family, of a family. So paid family leave can be used to provide caregiving leave to a sick family member, but there's a legal definition of who is considered family. It's child, spouse, domestic partner, sibling, grandparent, grandchild, parent-in-law. But the problem is that that doesn't necessarily reflect the way that people experience family. And that's particularly true for LGBTQ folks and immigrants whose conception of family might be more expansive than a traditional legal definition of family allows for. The sixth barrier that we see is lack of job protection. This is a big one and we're gonna get into the specifics later, but the issue generally is just that for some people you can take paid family leave, you can receive money for paid family leave, but then you can be fired for taking paid family leave. The phrase that we use is that your job isn't protected during the time that you take leave and we're gonna get more into that later. Um, the seventh reason that we see is that it's really difficult for independent contractors to access the benefits. Um, we know that California is a state full of independent contractors and gig workers and part-time workers and paid family leave does apply if you pay into the system. You can receive a benefit from that system. But, you know, I am a, I am a full-time employee and my taxes automatically take paid family leave, take SDI payments out of it. And so I know that I qualify and I don't have to do anything to additionally qualify. For independent contractors, they have to jump through several additional hoops to become eligible for that system. And the last reason that we see all the time is that many public employees are not included. So public employees, like if you work for the county or city or state, are mostly excluded from the paid family leave system. And some governments provide their own benefits, but some don't. So public employees are largely subject to whatever their employer provides and their union says. And if we can move on, we have two poll questions. The first is, have you or someone you know experienced any barriers to taking paid time off? Alejandra, I don't think I can see the results, so you might have to 
to tell we us. We are seeing the responses right come in. Um, uh, it looks like I cannot I cannot share the poll until everyone finishes voting. Um, we have about 78% yes. Have you or someone you know experienced any barriers to taking paid time off? 78% yes, no. The votes are coming in. I see them. They're moving. They're moving. I'll give it another five seconds. Right. So we had 75% say yes, 25% um, say no. All right, that is really helpful to know. That's a huge percentage saying yes. So we'll get into kind of what the ins and outs of those barriers are later. If you answered yes to the previous question, what barriers did you or someone you know encounter? You can just type that directly into the chat so we'll know for later to make sure that we address it. All right, so for now, um, I'm going to pass it to Julia to get into the new laws that have come out in response to COVID-19. Thanks, Aditi. Um, so we are going to go over all of the laws that relate to paid leave and time off, but we know that um, COVID-19 is sort of front of a lot of people's minds, so I wanted just to quickly go over some of the new changes that have been passed um, in response to the pandemic. Um, and one thing that this has really highlighted in terms of our movement for paid family and medical leave here in California is we know that families are living paycheck to paycheck. And in normal times, this places huge financial burden on families and, and it keeps them working through situations when they need to be at home caring for others or being with new babies or they're sick themselves. And now with um, employers shutting down, workers have lost their income and health insurance and other benefits that we all depend on. So the same barriers that folks have been facing before are intensified and um, as folks have mentioned, really magnified for the most vulnerable um, and marginalized communities. Um, and so we know that although the federal government has passed some legislation that really will help many people, um, it, it is not getting to everyone. I'm sorry, I realized I forgot to turn on my video. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your patience um, with this. <clears throat> so um, there are lots of things that are happening and, and changing and we're gonna we're gonna go through some of the basic protections related to COVID now and then move back to the protections that have always existed. Good. Um, go to the next one. Thank you. So the federal government passed a law called the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, and basically what this does is provide additional rights so my cat is um, helping me present, um, to employees who work for employers with fewer than 500 employees. So this is a little bit counterintuitive because it's actually covering only smaller employers rather than larger employers. And that is excluding a lot of people. Um, we also know that most healthcare workers are excluded from a lot of the protections in this federal law. Um, it also only applies to people who are not able to telework. So folks who can't work remotely um, and still have jobs that are open and requiring them to go into work. And there are two basic provisions that were provided for in this, in this new federal law. You can go to the next one. The first is that it applies for emergency paid sick leave, and the second is emergency family and medical leave. Um, and you all are going to become really familiar with these concepts. They are related, but slightly different, and we're going to talk about why that is. So emergency paid sick leave, this is different than the paid sick leave laws that exist um, in cities and counties in the state level. It's a federal law that says 
um, workers who qualify, so again, workers who are work with employers with less than, um, fewer than 500 employees, um, can have basically up to two weeks of paid sick leave to use specifically for circumstances related to COVID-19. So they're under a quarantine or a stay-at-home order, as we are currently here in the state of California, um, and or they've been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine or isolate. This usually applies to folks who have been exposed to the virus, have, have family member or other contacts with the, with the virus, uh, a medical professional specifically telling you to stay home, or you have some other um, characteristic that makes you particularly um, vulnerable and or you are experiencing symptoms of the virus itself. And this is um, a fully paid sick leave law, but it has a cap of $511 per day. Employers are supposed to provide this sick leave directly to their employees, and then later the employers can seek reimbursement from the federal government for the costs that they are incurring. The other provision of the sick leave law is slightly different. And it basically creates a hierarchy. If you are taking the time to care for yourself, you get the full pay. But if you need the time to care for someone else, the rate of wage replacement is reduced. <clears throat> and so we see that if you are using these paid days off to care for a family member who is sick or quarantined, or to care for a child because the child's school or child care facility is closed, then you get less pay, only two thirds of your pay, and the cap is up to $200 per day. The mechanism is the same, the pay should come directly from the employer, and then later the employer can seek reimbursement from the federal government. So it's a little bit confusing because the reason that someone is taking the time off leads to a very direct economic consequence. Even though it's the same law and the same bucket of you know, paid sick hours, um, essentially, the number of hours provided under this law is 80 hours for a full-time worker, and it's prorated for part-time workers to sort of be what you would typically get in a two-week period. Can go forward a little bit. Um, and then the federal law has a second extended leave provision. So the first one. Um, is talking really about sort of two weeks worth of paid time off. The second part is, um, is uh, related to folks who need longer than that, particularly because of school closures or daycare closures, childcare closures. And this says that if you worked with your employer for at least 30 days, after you take those first 10 days, you can actually have 10 more weeks so a total of 12 weeks of job protected time off and partial pay at that two thirds pay rate to care for your child while they're unable to go to school or daycare because of a care closure. Um, and Aditi is gonna get into the FMLA and job protection laws in a minute. Um, but one thing I should note when we're talking about paid sick days laws and this emergency paid sick leave law, it's a little bit different because um, both things are related. Typically, wage replacement and job protection are different protections, but these come in the same uh, legal protection and um, can help you. So I, I am wanting to make sure that we are answering questions, and I know I'm going through this really quickly. Um, so uh, I just want to let folks know that we are going to have questions at the end, and I'm going to answer some of them now, and also that um, there are going to be upcoming webinar series. So please type all your questions. We're going to do our best to get this information into your hands who are dealing with all of these conditions. Um, most of the questions I see are related to paid family leave. So I'm going to, um, oh, the second law is not available to employees who have the ability to telework. So. Um, it basically the the um, the the sick leave part. Um, if you can work, if you're sick and you can't work, then you can't work. Um, and in order to get the um, provision for the children, the childcare leave, you have to show that you've exhausted other childcare options. 
So it depends a little bit on how flexible your employer or your telework options are. Um, but essentially, this the law is structured so that people are using this as a last resort. I can't find, um, I don't have a partner that I can split childcare with and divide up the day. I'm not able to work in off hours. Um, you know, my children are young or they are older. You have to sort of show that you don't have other options before you can access this leave is the design and intent. Um, and then I see another question um, to qualify. Is it 30 day employment record with the employer? Yes. And that is a change. Aditi is going to um, get into the eligibility requirements for FMLA in a little bit. And that 30 day requirement is a huge shift because normally you have to work with your employer for a much longer period of time to qualify for job protected time off um, the way that this is structured under the um, FMLA. So I think we can, um, uh, is the school related position given to only those who can't receive unemployment or is this aside from unemployment? These are separate concepts. We're gonna get into the unemployment at the end of the pres presentation. Um, some of the unemployment provisions suggest that if you have access to other kinds of paid leave, uh, you should be getting those first. There's also, this is only available to people who are currently working and currently attached to an employer. So if your employer has closed down or has furloughed all of their workers, then all of these provisions, the emergency paid sick leave and the emergency family leave to care for children who are out of school, aren't going to apply to you because your employer is closed. So this is really only relevant for folks whose employers are open, whose employers are fewer than 500 employees, and who are still attached to their employer. So we can um, skip ahead. Um, we, can, we can go, um, keep going. Um, and I just wanna say that obviously those are huge gaps. And so there's a lot going on to fill those gaps at the local, state, and even um, other levels. So the city of San Jose has passed a sick leave law that covers workers, employers at businesses over 500 employees. If you work in the city of San Jose, um, you can go ahead. The city of um, Los Angeles has passed a similar um, provision. I know ADT was working hard on that. Um, and it similarly covers workers who were left out of the federal bill because of that 500 employee threshold, um, and um, and I know that we can go to the next slide. The city of San Francisco has actually passed a law that is similar that's covering um, people who are work for larger employers in the city of Oakland. I anticipate it's going to pass a law very similar um, shortly. And this all leads into my next point, which is sort of the classic lawyer caveat. These laws and regulations are changing extraordinarily quickly. Um, in fact, just yesterday, Governor Newsom signed an executive order uh, extending paid sick leave protections to uh, food industry workers at employers over 500 employees. So these are folks who work in, um, like, you know, larger employer restaurant chains farm workers, delivery truck drivers in the food industry and food systems now have access to this um, paid sick time, even if they work for employers over 500 employees. And that's just the change that happened yesterday. Uh, so that's all to say that um, these things are, are changing and I expect that they will change again. So folks need to know that um, it's a great idea to continue to check back into these resources to get um, the the um, most current um, information. And I see that folks are clarifying with the specific ins and outs of some of the local policies ordinance. And I think that's great. Um, the main point that I wanted to convey is that people are trying to fill these gaps and it's happening piecemeal and it's happening sort of consistently. So you wanna check in um, to get the most current information that you can. Um, we can go to the next one. And even before all of this happened, California and many jurisdictions had local paid sick days laws. We still do. Um, the state of California, the 
explore the minimum amount of paid sick leave and paid safe days that an employer can provide is three days. Um, and again, you can use your paid sick days for things like um, accessing preventative care, which means going to doctor's appointments. You can also use them as paid safe days, um, which are days that survivors may need to stay safe. Um, and again, this is the floor. Um, many places, we can go to the next slide, um, provide for a higher floor. Um, and, you know, cities like San Francisco, Oakland, Emeryville, Berkeley, Los Angeles, Santa Monica, a lot of jurisdictions have a higher minimum of required paid sick days. Again, one, one sort of problem that people are confronting in the current situation is you have to be working at your employer and your employer has to be open <laughs> in order for you to be able to access these paid sick days, which is, you know, a problem for a lot of people. Um, you know, California reached 2.7 million unemployment claims. Uh, so a lot of people aren't gonna be able to access this. I see some questions about the slides getting sent out. Yes, the slides are gonna be um, sent out. I see questions about uh, full-time and part-time employees. These, these paid sick leave measures are available and the federal law I, I talked about before are available for the, to, excuse me, full and part-time employees, but it's essentially prorated. So generally you um, earn and accrue paid sick days based on the hours that you work. So you're gonna earn fewer paid sick days if you work fewer hours. And again, the paid time off under the federal law is prorated if you are a part-time employee to sort of what those typical hours are. Um, um, and I see some questions about exemptions from providing paid sick days. Nonprofits are employers. They are covered by the same laws that I have talked about. Um, and uh, there aren't really many other ex exemptions from the paid sick leave laws. Uh, really all workers should be covered by most of those laws unless uh, there is the employee threshold exemption. Can um, continue? And again, um, these laws, all of these laws have uh, prohibitions against discrimination and retaliation. So if folks are afraid, and this is something we are hearing about a lot, even if they do have paid sick days, they're afraid to ask or they're being told they can't use them. Um, and in this very precarious time for a lot of workers, particularly the low wage workers that we work with, um, this is a real barrier and a real problem um, and choice that people are focusing on. Um, you know, the law does say that discrimination and retaliation is prohibited. Again, the reality can look different for folks on the ground, but, um, and these, again, the reason you can use these, these days um, is pretty vast. So to care for others, to care for yourself, to go to doctor's appointments, and for reasons um, related to domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. So I'm gonna pass it back to Aditi, who's gonna talk about um, more California-based programs um, related to job protection and wage replacement. And again, we're gonna have more questions at the end. So take it away, Aditi. Awesome, thank you, Julia. So I'm going to talk about family leave laws, paid family leave laws and job protection. A lot of times when we talk about family leave in general, um, people usually just talk about the length of time. You hear that a lot. We, we say, you know, Australia gets 12 months off for paid family leave and Sweden has 18 months off for paid family leave. Um, so we're talking about the duration, but when we do that, we're forgetting two really important parts of paid family leave, the job protection and the wage replacements. So when we talk about that in this webinar, we're gonna be using these two symbols. The job protection is the lock, because it means that your job is locked down. It means that you can take time off of work to um, care for a new baby or a sick family member, and then you can come back to work and your employer has to give you the same job or a comparable job. And then the wage replacement is the cash because it's the amount of money that you're getting back when you take paid family leave. So job protected time off of work. There are several laws that protect your job when you take time off of work. Um, there are Family Medical Leave Act, California Family Rights Act, New Parent Leave Act, Pregnancy Disability Leave Law, Americans with Disability Act, and Fair Employment and Housing Act. We'll get into these individually. And if you're confused about your rights, there's a good reason. There are so many laws that overlap and intersect, and we're gonna try to demystify as best we can. 
in the remaining time we have. Okay, so the wage replacement laws that apply are paid family leave, disability insurance, and paid sick days. So there are multiple steps to ensure that you can exercise your rights. So we're gonna start at the beginning. Um, when you need to take time off of work, we know that that doesn't just happen automatically. First, you talk to your doctor and you communicate with your doctor about the reason that you need to take time off of work and how much time you should take. And for disability leave, you'll need a medical certificate. The second is that you should talk to your employer. You should tell your HR department or whoever handles personnel um, that you're going to need to take time off of work and do this as soon as is really possible for you. Um, first, you know, for some type of emergencies, you're just never, you're not going to know until it's really at the last minute. And for some, for example, if you're pregnant and you know that you want to take time off of work for um, bonding leave with your baby, you can do this about 30 days before you take that leave. And the third is to talk to the EDD, the Employment Development Department. Um, and right now the EDD is experiencing a lot of calls, but we've heard that they're hiring more people to try to field all the, all the demand right now. So just keep trying and you fill out the forms online or in paper um, and you can call them if you have questions. Okay, so job protection. Um, we're gonna talk about job protection first. Something to know about job protection is that it doesn't align with wage replacement. Um, Julia talked about how these paid sick days laws have both job protection and wage replacement in one law. That's not true for family leave laws. Um, so we're gonna talk about the lock first. Uh, this is the time that you can take time off of work and then come back to your same job. And then later we'll talk about um, the wage replacement part of it. So you can take 12 weeks of job protection um, when you are, I think this might be the next slide. Sorry, Alejandra. Yes, there we are. 12 weeks of job protection um, when you are bonding with a new baby. And that's a baby that comes to you by um, birth, adoption, or foster care. When you are caring for a family member with a serious health condition, and that includes COVID-19. And when you are dealing with your own serious health condition. And that also includes COVID-19. The big question is, do you qualify for the 12 weeks of job protection? So here are the basic requirements to qualify for the job protection. The first is the amount of time. You have to have worked at your job for one year. And this is, Julia kind of flagged this um, earlier when she said that for emergency sick leave, you only need to have worked at the job for 30 days. For these types of protections under um, the Family Medical Leave Act and the California Family Rights Act and New Parent Leave Act, you have to have worked at the job for one year. The second type of eligibility is the employer size. If you are taking time off to care for someone else, you have to have worked for an employer with 50 employees or less. So this means that if you work for an employer with 49 employees and you need to take time off of work to care for a sick spouse, your job isn't necessarily protected. And if you're taking time off of work to care for a new baby, your employer has to have 20 or more employees. We know this is a huge problem, that these numbers are way too high, and this really um, means that a lot of people aren't eligible to take paid family leave. And so this is something that advocates have been working on for, for years to try to get um, the employer size as low as possible really to one, um, one employee. All right, so your rights under FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act, CIFRA, um, the California Family Rights Act, and the New Parent Leave Act. So here, here's kind of the conclusion of it. At the, the length is you can take 12 weeks of leave a year to care for yourself, a sick family member, or a new baby. The job protection, your job is protected if you work for an employer of more than 20 for a new baby and more than 50 for caregiving. Your health benefits continue. You have health insurance during the period of time that you're taking leave. And anti-discrimination protections. You cannot be discriminated against or retaliated against for taking this leave. And retaliation doesn't just mean firing, it means any type of adverse action against you in your employment. So this can be a demotion, this can be a transfer to another job with less pay, this can be fewer hours. Essentially, if you come back to your job and they treat you worse, um, that's retaliation.
All right. So we've talked about job protection when you need to care for a new baby. Now we're going to back up in chronology a little bit and talk about what happens when you're pregnant with the new baby. So under California law, you can take disability leave when you're disabled due to pregnancy or childbirth. So at some point in your pregnancy, you will be unable to do the job that you were once able to perform. And that's the term is that you're disabled due to pregnancy. And at that point, you can take pregnancy disability leave. In California, you get four months total for pregnancy disability leave. Typically, people don't take that full amount of time. Usually, the amount of time that people are disabled due to pregnancy is about four weeks before childbirth and six to eight weeks after childbirth. It's usually about six weeks for a vaginal birth and eight weeks for a C-section. But you have four months. Every pregnancy is different. People might need to take a different amount of time. That's the, you know, you decide that length with your doctor and your doctor provides the medical certification saying that's the amount of time that you need. Um, that amount of time is unpaid, but we're going to talk about how it relates to wage replacement later. So during the time that you're on pregnancy disability leave, you continue your health benefits. So you keep your health insurance while you're on that leave. You can be gone for four months and your employer keeps paying into the health for your health insurance. Um, that time can be used prenatal or postnatal care and everyone's needs are different. People will need it for different things at different times. It can be taken intermittently. So what this means is that you don't have to take it all at once. You can take it you know, for two weeks if you need it and then go back to work and then take it for two more weeks or even a couple of hours if you need it to go to a doctor's visit. Um, and this applies to all employers with five or more employees. All right, reasonable accommodations. So if you're pregnant, one, one option is to go on pregnancy leave. Another option is to request reasonable accommodations at your job. Reasonable accommodations is a change in your work that your employer gives you to accommodate a physical or mental disability. And disability is defined in this context as any physical or mental condition that stops you from performing your usual work for more than a week. So disability can be anything and this, you know, in the pregnancy context, we usually talk about pregnancy or postpartum depression or recovery from childbirth. Um, but, you know, here we're also talking about COVID-19 and other types of serious illnesses um, that one can face. So an example of a reasonable accommodation for in the pregnancy context is you might need a chair to sit on at work if you're standing all day or you might need a change in your schedule because you get sick at certain times of the day, or you might need a restriction in lifting if you're you know, in a very physically demanding job. So those are some types of reasonable accommodations. Um, this applies to employers of more than five um, under the Fair Employment and Housing Act in California, and more than 15 under the Americans with Disabilities Act. In California, most employees are covered under FEHA. There are, there are some that aren't, there are some employers that aren't, but generally, if you work for an employer of five or more, you are um, eligible for reasonable accommodations when you need it. Um, and in relation to COVID-19, we want to highlight that a compromised immune system is can be considered a disability. And if you have a compromised immune system, you can request reasonable accommodations. Um, one reasonable accommodation could be working from home or taking unpaid leave. Um, and generally a, a mild sickness like a, a common cold or the you know, seasonal flu won't qualify for um, a disability such that you need a reasonable accommodation. But um, something like COVID-19 or more serious than that could. Okay, so one type of reasonable accommodation is unpaid leave. Um, so the example of this could be if you have a compromised immune system and you need to stay home during COVID-19, your employer can say, I'll give you unpaid leave as a reasonable accommodation. It's obviously not ideal because it is unpaid, but the benefit of this is that your job is protected. So once COVID-19 is done, you can still, you can return to your job. Um, and this is true even if you've taken your leave under other laws, right? So we talked about the Family Medical Leave Act and the California Family Rights Act. And even if you've, you've taken up all of that leave, you still have the option of taking reasonable accommodation and taking unpaid leave as a reasonable accommodation. You'll never run out of this. This is always gonna be with you if you need it.
Um, yes, and so another type of reasonable accommodation is teleworking. Um, so, you know, same as if you have a, a compromised immune system, you can say, I'd like to work from home because of COVID-19 and because of my immune system. The caveat is that you have to be able to actually work from home. So you have to be able to perform what's called the essential functions of your job um, in order for it to count as a reasonable accommodation for your job. So, you know, for example, if you're a bartender, then teleworking isn't gonna work because you're just making drinks for yourself at home. But if you, um, you know, generally work on the computer all day, you will probably be able to telework as a reasonable accommodation. The downside is your employer during this time does not have to provide you with health benefits. So this is different from the leave under the other laws that we discussed, which you're still entitled to your health insurance. Here, if you're taking unpaid leave as a reasonable accommodation, you're not necessarily entitled to your health insurance. Okay, so wage replacement. Um, we've talked about the job protection thus far, the lock. Now we're going to talk about the money. So, you know, the big question is when you take leave, are you still getting paid? So there are two sources of payment for paid family leave. Um, the first is state agency. So it's the Employment Development Department is a state agency and it pays out um, through a variety of programs. The state's is disability insurance, unemployment insurance, disability insurance, and paid family leave. The second is your employer. Your employer could have a separate um, you know, benefit it gives you uh, to pay for paid family leave. So do you qualify to receive state funds? The eligibility for employer funds um, is you know, different by employer. You just have to talk to your employer and see what type of benefits they give you. The eligibility for state funds is, is this right here. So here's the basic deal. There is a fund called the SDI fund, the State Disability Insurance Fund. For most employees, if you pay into that fund, you can collect from that fund. So if you take away one thing about paid family leave today, that this is sort of the most important when we were talking about eligibility. And the way you know if you pay into that fund is that your paycheck will say it, so, or your pay stub will say it. So if you look at your pay stub and it lists uh, CASDI, California State Disability Insurance. If it, if it lists that, then that means that you pay into the fund and then you can collect from the fund when you need it. Um, so it's generally as easy as that, but there are some hiccups. Um, and, you know, the other types of requirements are that you have to be in the labor market, so you have to be working, you have to have had a wage loss, or you will have a wage loss when you take time off of work. Um, you have to be unable to do the regular and customary work. You can't do the job that you typically can do. Um, you have to have earned at least $300 from which these deductions, these SDI deductions on your pay stub, were withheld during the base period. The majority of people who contribute to SDI fund earned at least $300 during the period that's, that's relevant. Um, but if you have a specific question about you, you know, feel free to reach out to us and ask. And the last thing is that immigration and citizenship don't matter. Um, and you know, we talked about this before, this point is really important. Um, immigration status does not matter for paid family leave and state disability insurance. The tricky thing on this point is that the form that you fill out does ask for a social security number. Do not use a social security number that is not yours. Instead, what you do is you attach a W-2 or a pay stub that shows that you paid into SDI, and that will be sufficient for EDD. Okay, so state disability insurance. We're going to talk about state disability insurance first um, and then paid family leave. So state disability insurance is a fund that gives you partial pay when you are disabled, including when you're disabled because of pregnancy or when you're disabled because of COVID-19 or when you're disabled for another type of illness. Um, when you are disabled, you receive 60 or 70 percent of your income with an inverse relationship to how much you earn. So basically the way that it works is that if you're in the top two thirds of wage earners, you get 60% of your income. And if you're in the bottom one third, 
you get 70% of your income. A medical certification is required. So this means that your doctor needs to certify that you're disabled and that you can no longer work. You can receive 52, you can receive benefits for 52 weeks every year. Most people typically use it for 10 to 12 weeks, that's about the average, but you're eligible for 52 weeks. And you use it for the amount of time that you're disabled and that's different person to person. Um, there is a one week waiting period once you apply typically, um, and you won't be paid for the first seven days. And you can apply as soon as you're disabled, and you can also apply retroactively. So you could apply and say, I was disabled two weeks ago, couldn't work during that period, I lost income, here's my medical certification, and then you can retroactively receive that money. And you can apply retroactively for 49 days. So I said that there was a one week waiting period. That waiting period is currently waived because of COVID-19. So there's no waiting period right now for SDI. Okay, so paid family leave. Um, there are two reasons why people are able to take paid family leave in California. The first is to bond with a new baby, and we often call this bonding leave. Um, and the second is to care for a sick family member. We often call this caregiving leave. So we're gonna talk about bonding leave first. Um, when you take paid family leave for bonding, you receive 60 or 70% of your income, exact same relationship as SDI. You receive this amount of money for six weeks. And that, amount, that duration is gonna be bumped up to eight weeks starting this year, starting July 1st, 2020. But if you apply today, you'll receive that amount for six weeks. There is no waiting period for paid family leave for bonding leave. So that one week waiting period that we talked about with SDI, um, that's currently waived, but usually not, um, that doesn't exist for paid family leave. You can, there's no waiting period, you apply and you can start receiving benefits on day one. So pregnancy leave that we talked about before, pregnancy disability leave is for the pregnant person, but bonding leave is for both parents and it's equal for both. In California, we don't talk about maternity leave or paternity leave. When we talk about caring for your baby, we're talking about bonding leave. It's six weeks for both parents. One difference though is that the non-birth parent might need to show proof of the relationship. And the reason is because if you're the birth parent and you've already applied for disability insurance um, when you needed it because you were disabled because of pregnancy, the EDD already knows that you're pregnant and knows that you are you know, likely going to have a baby and they'll just send you the application for paid family leave. So you're already in their system and they know that it's coming. If you're, if you're not the pregnant person, then you will have to apply and show that you know, this is the proof of the relationship. Um, paid family leave can be taken at once or in parts. And so you can take you know, two weeks when your baby is born, go back to work, take two more weeks, go back to work, take two more weeks. Um, or you can take all six weeks at once. And just like with SDI, you can apply retroactively. So you could take the time off of work and then apply and say, hey, I, I took, you know, two weeks um, a few weeks ago. Okay, so paid family leave for caregiving. Um, this is the second reason to take paid family leave. And you use caregiving leave when you're caring for a seriously ill family member. And family member is defined in the law. It's defined as taking time off to care for a child, spouse, domestic partner, parent, grandparent, grandchild, parent-in-law, and sibling. And just like with bonding leave, it's 60 or 70%, and it's for six weeks, and there is no waiting period. And just like with bonding leave, you will have to submit some documents. Um, but this time, the documents that you're submitting is that you're certifying that someone is sick and you need to care for them. So the documents are medical certification, um, care recipients, authorization for disclosure of personal health information, and statement of care recipient. These documents can be found on the EDD website, so don't worry about creating them anew. Just go to the website and it'll show you all the documents and forms that you have to submit for paid family leave. Um, this can be taken 
all at once or in parts, um, just like for bonding leave, and it can be applied retroactively, just like for bonding leave. Okay. So we have been kind of building to this. Um, we have talked about job protection and we've talked about wage replacement and now we're gonna put them together. The top is a cash symbol. Uh, so this is the when you get the money and the bottom is the lock. So this is when your job is protected. Okay, so if we look at the left side, that is pregnancy. When you're pregnant, um, your job is protected for four months total when you're pregnant. Usually, as we said, people end up taking four weeks before the birth and six to eight weeks after the birth, but your job is protected for four months. And when you're pregnant, you receive 60 to 70 percent of your wages. Now, if we go to the right and look at bonding time, the, you know, the baby is here. How long can you take off to, to bond with your baby? Your job is protected for 12 weeks and um, and you receive paid family leave, you receive the wage replacement for six weeks. And so again, you can take off that entire 12, but you're only going to be paid for half of it. Okay. I think next one. Okay. So in that scenario that we just talked about, those are employees that are eligible for all of the benefits. This, this chart looks a little bit different because it's the employees who are not eligible for FMLA, CIFRA, and NPLA. The reasons that they might not be eligible are they have not worked for an, employee, an employer for long enough. So they've worked for under a year or they work for a small employer. So as a reminder, under 20, for, you, you're not necessarily eligible for bonding leave. And under 50, you're not necessarily eligible for caregiving leave. So the situation here is a little bit worse because they're not eligible for the full levels of protection that they would be if they worked for large employers. So for pregnancy leave, your job is protected for four months if you're working for an employer with five or more employees and you re you're receiving 60 to or 70% of your pay through SDI. So for pregnancy leave, you're still looking fine. But when you go to bonding leave on the right, here's where we're getting in trouble. You receive 60 or 70% of your pay for six weeks, but your job is not protected. Um, so, you know, this is, this is a bad situation. This is really why a lot of people aren't taking paid family leave. We know that, um, and it really needs to be fixed. And this is the interaction when, um, when it's caregivers that need to take the time off of work. So these are the people that are taking time off of work to care for a sick family member. And when that is the situation, you get 12 weeks of job protected time and six weeks of pay. All right. Um, and I think, yes, I think we're gonna skip through all of these for time's sake. And I'm seeing that there are a lot of questions in the chat. I'm sorry, I didn't answer them along the way. I just wanted to get through these slides. So I'll try to you know, go through and answer them now, but remember to contact us if we don't get to something. Um, and I'm gonna pass it back to Julia. Great, so um, I'm gonna go through this really rather quickly because we do wanna get to everyone's question. One question that I wanted to address at the outset um, that I think was unclear from what I said earlier is, the federal protections that I talked about at the beginning are only for circumstances that are directly related to COVID-19. All of the laws that Aditi talked about are existing California protections that apply in a variety of circumstances, including for COVID-19 and also for pregnancy bonding and all the things we talked about. So um, the part that she talked about is much more broadly applicable than the part that I talked about, but we wanted to highlight that those protections are available as well. And as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, you know, a lot of people are employed, and so job protection laws don't apply if you're not employed. Um, there are 22 million people in the United States and, um, you know, a huge number in California. So the wage replacement program that typically applies for folks who are unemployed is um, called unemployment insurance. There's 
two major differences from the wage replacement programs that ADT talked about, which is um, ADT talked about disability insurance and paid family leave. One major difference is that lawful authorization to work in the United States is absolutely an eligibility requirement for unemployment insurance. So undocumented workers should not apply for unemployment insurance. Again, that is different from disability and paid family leave, even though it's the same state agency that administers all three of those benefits. Um, undocumented workers should not apply for unemployment insurance. Um, and then the other is the reason that you're usually asking for unemployment insurance is that you are able and available to work, but there is no work available for you. Um, Typically, unemployment insurance benefit amount is from $400 to $450 a week. That has changed based on um, current law at the federal level. But normally, unemployment insurance is less money than disability or paid family leave. So it should be a last resort. If somebody is eligible for disability or paid family leave, it's, it's usually better for them to get those programs. Um, and also, just, for, just, just to mention, um, if somebody has been fired or laid off recently, um, but they do have a qualifying health condition for disability, or they do have a reason to use paid family leave, they can still get those programs, even though they've been fired from their employer, because again, the programs come from the state. So we can skip to the next one. Um, it's the EDD, it's not available to undocumented workers. There's normally a one-week rating period, but that's been waived because of COVID. Go ahead. Um, the federal government passed a law that greatly enhances unemployment benefits in the state, um, and it does three main things. So employment, unemployment is a state-by-state -state program, but it gets funding from the federal government. So that structure of the way the funding works and who is covered has changed. We can go to the next slide. The first is that it's been made longer. So typically, unemployment insurance in California is available for 26 weeks, but there's an extra 13 weeks of um, unemployment available if folks still need it. And um, the bigger change is that um, the federal government has passed what they call pandemic unemployment insurance that covers workers who are not typically eligible for unemployment insurance. And this means people who are self-employed. So think gig workers, think independent contractors, think um, you know, sole proprietors of businesses. Those people normally can't get unemployment insurance because they're not considered employees. But under the new federal law, they can actually access what they're calling pandemic unemployment insurance, which is basically unemployment insurance. So it's the special bucket of unemployment insurance for people who traditionally were never eligible for unemployment insurance. So that's really something important to keep in mind is that much more people are eligible for unemployment insurance at this point. Really the only group that's left out is um, undocumented workers. Go to the next slide. Um, and it's, it's also more money. The pandemic unemployment insurance um, is more money than traditional unemployment insurance in the state. Can go to the next one. Um, and it's also available to folks who are impacted by COVID-19. And this is a little bit less relevant in California because we do have state disability insurance. But if people are sick with COVID-19, they can get pandemic unemployment insurance, whereas normally they wouldn't be able to get um, unemployment insurance. Um, and also if they're caring for somebody else or if their school is closed, all of those reasons um, are now reasons in, for which folks can um, qualify for pandemic unemployment insurance. The reason this is such a big change is that, like I said before, normally to get unemployment insurance, you have to be considered able and available to work. And if you're sick with COVID-19, you're not able and available to work. But there's sort of these special exceptions to the way that unemployment insurance works. Um, and we're going to be covering it in a lot more detail in um, the next webinar as well. Um, the other big, big benefit of the federal law is that it has increased the amount of money that people can get on unemployment. Basically, it adds another $600 on top of the benefits that folks are entitled to. So now the unemployment range, instead of being from 40 
to $450 a week is, you know, $640 to $1,050 a week. And there are calculators on the EDD website that can help folks figure out how much they would be entitled to under all of these various benefits, including SCI and PFL. And for some people, it's actually going to be more money to get unemployment than SCI and PFL because of the $600 top-off. But that $600 top-off um, expires after the end of July this year. So we can go to the next one. Um, these slides are going to get sent out, but here are really important phone numbers for you to have um, to contact the Employment Development Department. The website is better than the phone. They are totally overwhelmed, and um, it's really hard to get through for people. But to keep it in your back pocket for more typical times. Next. Um, same, and there's a separate line for medical um, providers to get through, um, which is helpful for people to know. And then here's some other um, resources. I just want to mention that I work, um, my organization, Legal Aid at Work, people can call and get individualized help from our free helpline. And we also have a fact sheet that tries to put together, like Aditi showed you the slide with the wage replacement and the job protection. Um, we try to put all of the information together on the fact sheet because if you go to the individual agency, they will only give you the information about their piece of the puzzle. And there's a lot of protections going on, a lot of things that, um, are happening, so it's hard to fit together um, for individual folks. Yeah, and I'm going to um, go ahead and I think pass it back so we can do questions and closing. Thanks so much for your time. I'm so sorry. Is there all... one thing I forgot? Wait, yeah. I'm so sorry because I mentioned um, that undocumented workers aren't eligible for unemployment. One other extremely recent change is that Governor Newsom has also um, announced that he is going to make a fund available for people, for undocumented workers who aren't eligible for unemployment. It's not, frankly, it's not um, a lot of money, but it is a, a step, and that is something else that's going to be available. Thank you so much. Um, we can also um, go a lot more into that conversation next time. Um, it's very exciting. We have a lot of calls um, from folks about the the funds available. Um, let's. We have about eight minutes left, and we want to make sure and get to your questions. Um, so, Julia, um, Aditi, Jenya, if we can look at some of the questions in the chat, um, we also have um, Q and A. Do you want to read some of the questions? Um, a couple that I mean, I see one about the extended 13 weeks for mm -hmm. unemployment benefits. That will be automatic. It won't be a separate um, application process. Also, for the pandemic unemployment insurance, um, PUA, the application for that is going up on the EDD's website um, on April 28th. It's not mm -hmm. there yet. Um, for, for Julie and Aditi, I think one thing I've seen in the questions that I'm curious about myself is um, there's a lot of reasons people are staying home now. And one is if you're immunocompromised or have reasons for just literally just fear of going to work, what kinds of protections are there for people? Let's say you're an essential worker or your workplace just hasn't closed for whatever reason in California. Do you have, what kinds of protections are available to you in that case? Um, hi, this is Aditi. I can take it and then Julia, please feel free to step in as well. So if you're immunocompromised and um, you can get a medical certification from your doctor saying that that qualifies as a disability, um, then you can get, um, you know, SDI, you can get state disability insurance during the time of COVID-19. And and, and, the, and also, sorry, you can also request, um, you know, re request an accommodation, um, a reasonable accommodation from your employer um, that if you're immunocompromised, you can say, you know, I need a reasonable accommodation that allows me to do my work, but differently. And so, for example, that can be teleworking or, you know, something else that you can work out with your employer where you're still able to, to work but not have to show up physically if that's possible for your job. Yeah. 
in, since there are, you know, there's in our governors talking about people needing to stay home, there's this overall feeling that we're safest at home, and yet there are workplaces that are open. If you're not necessarily immunocompromised, but just have fear about working, I'm curious, what does a person do in that situation? Because that must be really pretty widespread right now, right? Yeah, Jenya, yeah, I think that's a great that's a great point, um, and I'm not sure that I have a clear answer for that, Julie. I'm wondering if if you do as well. Like I have also, you know, wondered if you know if you live with someone who's immunocompromised, but you yourself um, aren't and are having to go to work. Um, Julie, I don't know if you have something to add. Yeah, I think um, I think the question, the answer is similar to what Aditi said about if that person requires your care, like like a sort of typical paid family leave application, um, their doctor can certify that you need to care for them. And then if you qualify for paid family leave or for job protected leave in order to care for your family member with a serious health condition, then you can use that as an option. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A for baby bonding. Can your employer force you to use your sick and vacation time during the 12 weeks of job protection? Um, um, it's a, it, if you are um, on leave because of your own health condition, like a pregnancy-related disability, they can require you to use your sick time because um, you're out for your own health condition. If you are out because you are bonding with a baby, but you are well um, and you are using paid family leave, there is um, something that allows them to require you to use two weeks of your vacation time before you take paid family leave. And the other thing, but um, a great tip. A great tip is to request that your employer integrate or coordinate the paid time off that you have with your state benefits available from the EDD. It doesn't cost your employer any more money because basically as Aditi explained, you get 60 or 70% of your pay from the state. So you can apply 40% of a sick day and you'll end up with your complete pay and it spreads out the use of your paid time off over a much longer period of time and allows you to get full wage replacement over a period of time. If your employer allows you to do that, it's a great option. Any other questions that we are seeing? While our panelists are looking over the questions, um, just a special note to um, all of the registered nurses and IBCLCs, um, you will receive your CEUs and SERPs by email after filling out the evaluation. Um, after the webinar, participants will receive an evaluation to complete. Um, after they submit the evaluation, a link will be provided immediately. Please click on the link. This, this will direct you to a form that must be completed in order for you to receive your certificate. The form will ask you for your name, first and last, and your license number if applicable. After completing and submitting the form, you should receive your certificate within 30 minutes. If there are questions about CEUs, um, please let us know. Um, we, we know that this was a, a lot of information. I was taking down a ton of, of notes um, I also have questions myself, and I know that in the next webinar, we are going to go further into these conversations. This is a lot. Um, please keep in, keep in mind that normally we do this in an eight-hour day training, um, and we are trying to get this information to you all in two-hour increments um, for these webinars. Um, so please be patient with us. Um, the chat remains open. If you have questions that were not answered today that you would like to make sure that we answer in the next two webinars, please go in and type them now into the chat so that we can um, adjust for the next webinar, which is on the 22nd, same time, uh, 10 to 12, and then on May 5th, um, again, 10 to 12. Um, that's for the English one and the Spanish one are the same days, um, but one to three. So please uh, put your questions in. Um, for the, the registration, uh, you will all receive 
um, an invitation to register again through Zoom for each webinar. Um, it's for our own protection um, and safety so that others cannot hack our system. Um, you will be able to register again, get your own link, um, and we will probably set up again about 10 minutes before um, and go through. We are going to leave more room for Q&A at the next time. Um, any other questions, uh, panelists, that you can see that need to be answered right now? Um, I've been answering some of them in this question and answer box. Does that get sent out to participants as well? Uh, yeah, you can. And, and, or we can make sure to answer them next time. Yep, you have the Q&A, click on that. Um, there are questions typed in directly, so please um, take a look at that as well. And yes, you will get access to all of this information. We're also going to go through the chat, um, pick out the questions so that we can type a Q&A response for folks. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we really appreciate having you here. Um, yes, the recording will be sent out along with the slides. Um, that will include all of the links. We will have the information shared for you all. Um, we just ask that you give us um, a day or so to be able to compile everything and have access for you. Um, thank you so much. Um, we appreciate you. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. You were all amazing. Um, we've all learned so much today and are very much appreciative of, of your time. So thank you all so much. Have a wonderful week. Um, stay safe and healthy. Yes, and thank you. Alejandra, there's, I think, one last part for the CEUs and SERPs that needs to be read out. And I'm not sure if that's. I did. Okay. I did. Oh, sorry. Yep. <laughs> anyway, yep. this has been great. These are such great questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful weekend.